Welcome to Module 9C, Practical Applications Related to Unit Number 3. This covers the three sub-areas which are the most packed sections of the semester. The information is so dense that an added video is provided to let the information sink in and be applied practically to issues on. Number 1, Voluntary Skills in the First Year. This is information covered in Module Number 8. Secondly, growth and maturation, um, this covered in modules 9a and b. And finally, number three, physiological considerations of training. Uh, this will be for module number 10. At this point, that third one is a leap forward. Module 10 has not yet been covered if you're following this in serial fashion. Um, this is a good foreshadowing of what is to come. You will find the transition naturally arises as we discuss the development of children as they grow, mature, and progress toward training in specific sport and activity. This slide is a quick overview that takes us through these three sub-areas sub covered in unit number three. Number one, voluntary skills in the first year of life. The shadow of this area looms larger than you think. How infants walk, manipulate hands to reach and grasp are all basic skills to be used for the rest of their lives. Well, guess what? These skills are the basis for designing robots and robotic movement in general. These are the latest robots in the market. Samsung recently unveiled its most sophisticated robotic assistant that can now load dishwashers. Boston Dynamics has created different kinds of robots for specific applications to the military. If you click on the video, you will notice pretty sophisticated behavior from a robot. The human being the model, designers and engineers always look to the human behavior for robotic solutions for everyday tasks. However, imagine a robot in a karate fight. Do you think this robot can do this now? How is it able to track its components visually? If you think about it, the human is a tough act to follow. The eyes, the hands, the ability to reach home in and grasp in both stationary and dynamic situations. How are humans able to calibrate movement to grasp with exact size and shape of the target object? How are humans able to adjust the, pro the proper strength to hold an aluminum can without crushing it? Notice that the hands are a big deal. There are more substitutes for the human legs than the human hands. This is merely reviewing what you already know from the evolution of motor skills. The hands have no current substitute. Any substitute will only be able to do portions of what we can do, but not everything that the hands, for all its refinements. Think about everything that the hands can sense, the weight, the size, the texture, the shape. But really for every robotic engineer, the idea is to be able to simulate human action. We're not quite there yet in replicating the human hands. The focus in this slide is the visual system, the eyes. Watch the video at your own leisure. While you do that, ponder on the questions that are being posed. Imagine how a robot's eyes compares to this. Is this the basis of eye-hand coordination? And finally, what visual skills are important to be able to reach home and grasp? Early eye movements are ballistic, navigational, or what we call saccadic, and are meant to get the, ha the hand within the vicinity of the object being targeted. Black and white is vision is dominant, whereas no color vision is, is evident. The reach phase benefit, benefits from this. This is the primitive stage. The reach and grasp all happen in one shot or one fell swoop. 
The palmar grasp reflex allows the child to complete the grasp. The eyes then add skills in the latter half of the first year. This time, the ability to focus using clear retinal images. With color vision and guidance or tracking, skills are layered upon the existing psychiatric skills that were there from day one. This association of the reach from the grass becomes evident. The child begins to calibrate object size and shape, thus refining the home and face. This phase two of reaching skills is facilitated by visual guidance skills. Back to the summary slides. <clears throat> we now tackle the second sub area, which is growth and maturation. Growth and maturation take the lion's share of attention in this unit. You will see that this application will inevitably lead to solving problems that affect the United States. Do you see the big elephant in the room? This is confronting us whether you like it or not. And yes, we will talk about obesity. We cannot escape this concern. Growth. As a child grows and matures, all of those skills from the first year continue to amass. But the body itself is amassing size and function. Growth and size are linked, while function and maturation are associated words to take note of. Yes, size matters. Pictured on the left are Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, a famous basketball player, and Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee is an icon in the martial arts world today. How can someone small in stature take on opponents that are a head taller, at least a head taller than him? What keeps the legend alive is the power behind his diminutive size. He is smaller than the average American at 5'7". Size matters for sure. But check the video of his one-inch punch. He will revisit, we will revisit this ability to generate force coming from a small body. For now, suffice it to say that as much as, the, as size matters, speed also does. Begin contemplating the formula for generating force or power. The answer lies in the Newtonian equation F equals M, you should know this by now. Again, this will be revisited when we start talking about training uh, for strength um, in the third area of unit number three. Proportions also matter. As one grows, the proportion of body segments also change, not just height. Absolute height is one measure among many. It is not the only issue. Body segments enrich the story. Does Michael Phelps' long torso and relatively shorter legs work to his advantage in swimming? To emphasize the point, he wears the same pant size as the smaller El Garouge, an elite marathoner. What about Simone Biles? Her segments are more equally distributed. Is that advantageous to gymnasts? To emphasize the skewed proportions of this too, the waist level is almost similar for somebody as short as Simone Biles at 4'8 and Michael Phelps at 6'4. Do certain sports lend themselves to specific body configurations? Review what you know about body proportions. The diagram shows patterns among average people across the lifespan. How does this affect skills? Think, why do humans take a lot longer time to walk compared to other animals? How fast do puppies, chickens, cows, or any other farm animal, small and large, end up walking compared to humans? Could it be because the head, in proportion to the rest of the body, constrains movement? The head for the, 
for the first part of life sits atop a smaller proportion of the legs with a small feet for, with small feet forming the base of support does it surprise you that it takes a whole year before human infants begin to walk body type also matters we do not have time to quantify or measure somatotypes the diagram is a pictorial of the three dominant body types in humans suffice it to say that we eyeball somatotypes based on the shape this tends to work well in extreme ends of the spectrum endomorphs are roundish mesomorphs are squarish ectomorphs are linear this is significantly dictated by genetics nevertheless training and environment also shape the eventual outcome do certain sports however lend themselves to certain body types the other term you will hear is physique or morphology all referring to body configuration in truth humans are all over the spectrum of physique in this case, however, what somatotype is dominant in gymnastics? What about high jump? What about hammer throw? Finally, what about the 100 meter runner? Notice uh, Justin Gatlin in the 100 meter uh, dash. This sport requires power emanating from massive legs. Evidently, he is a combination of the mesomorphic type, muscular, and some longishness type, because long legs help. One can say the same thing about the gymnast. Simone Biles may be small in stature at 4'8", but she has to have longish characteristics to fulfill the requirements of her sport. Linearity is important in gymnastics judging. Therefore, it is the right combination of shape and training that may determine success in a sport. Here is an example of applying this concept in the context of team. One needs different somatotypes based on the position they play in the team. Football is a good example for this. For the linemen, which somatotype is most appropriate to play the ski role? Quarterback somatotype is predominantly what? And finally, wide receivers are predominantly which body shape in order to be able to fulfill their role in the team? Conversely, one somatotype can, can be the preferred configuration for a certain sport. For example, which type tends to dominate marathoners? Note the linearity in the legs, torso, and arms of these men. On the other hand, sumo wrestlers are built differently. So are basketball players. One can argue that the different positions in the basketball team also lend to different physiques. Nevertheless, it is a dominant theme in basketball that height is an advantage. Magic Johnson, here shown with a dream team in 1992, is a six, point, six foot nine guard. And look at all the massive upper body configurations of basketball players. Wouldn't you say this is configured for them to play the type of sport that they do? In the previous slide, you were directed to note the exceptions to the rule. In this slide, get to know Misty Copeland. Are there prominent exceptions to dance in terms of physique and somatotype? Are there diverse athletes of diverse shapes playing the same sport? You already know that an athlete is the sum of both her genetics and her environment. In real life, however, are you limited by your physique? Or does training and perseverance play into the equation? 
Here comes Misty Copeland who breaks all the stereotypes. Gone are the days when ballerinas are typically Caucasian with thin sinewy arms and stick-like legs. Click on the video. See how powerful and graceful she is, Misty Copeland. In her case, physique is not a detriment, but an asset. She is that good in what she does. She is the prima ballerina in the foremost ballet company in the United States, the American Ballet Theater. We are obviously talking about height in this slide. Yes, in the images below, we are tracking growth or the pictorial evolution of one of the most iconic athletes ever. Like all humans, he had to go through the same processes of growth and maturation that ordinary kids undergo. Let's stop eyeballing, however, and now get immersed in the measurement of growth. Which is closely depicted in these pictures? Distance or the velocity curve? Or the velocity of height, more specifically? This is clearly a very recognizable Michael Jordan. The famous story of him being cut from the varsity basketball team in high school stems from the fact that he hadn't peaked yet in his growth spurt at that time. The coach went and drafted a taller player in his place. After that summer, he came back having gained significantly in height. The legend was firmly on its way, but growth had to happen. You are responsible for knowing the difference between the distance curve versus the velocity curve. Which one is it in this case? As the slide title asks, why? Why is height not an accurate nor a particularly good measure of maturation? Study this picture. The boys with disparate heights, is there a chance that they are of the same age? Conversely, can they be of different ages and different heights, yet be at the same maturation level? Height is raw data that depicts distance information. It is stature at a certain age, but why is it not a good measure of maturation? It is not derived like velocity, delta D over delta T, this is depicted in the middle graph where the mountain, which is height velocity, shows the spurt of growth that occurs at no other time in life. At its apex, PHV or peak height velocity, it indicates when the child is growing the fastest. Overlaid in the graph are other measures of maturation. What do those numbers mean? Two, three, four, and five? And what do those words mean? Spermarchy, pubic hair, and genitalia. Finally, bone, the better and some say the gold standard in measuring maturation. What bone indices do we need to track in order to assess the health of a child? Let us continue discussing the velocity curve. These graphs show separately the development of boys and girls. And it says their sexual development, so this has to do with maturation. And then when combined together, we will look at the velocity curve in particular as we think about the growth spurt. The timing of the PHV, peak height velocity, is of particular value in assessing maturation. It is a mountain illustration. There is a base, which is the start of the mountain. There is the peak, and then there is the end as it approaches zero. Same thing with the girls. There's a base, there's a peak, and then there's the drop approaching zero. That is essentially all of the growth spurt, that whole mountain going up and then going down. Clearly, boys and girls have very different profiles, but only when they were plotted together do we see stark differences in both the broad expanse. Notice how 
early the girls start their growth spurt compared to the boys and the length of time that the growth continues for the boys versus for the girls. Now add the other measures of maturation that needs to be addressed. Pubic hair, breasts and genitalia. Clearly there are some aspects that are measured just for girls and then there are aspects that are measured for boys. I'm introducing, you shouldn't be introduced this, you should have seen this from the other slides, but dimorphism. Does this velocity chart show dimorphism, meaning differences in morphology between the girls and the boys? More importantly, from a health perspective, will height velocity tell us if growth is in jeopardy? What happens when you find deviations from this normal curves? We turn our attention to maturation. Make sure you understand what the Tanner scores mean. You were introduced to this in the slides previous to this, where you see the numbers two, three, four, and five. It's also available on this page. Um, these numbers mean something. In highly graphic and clear photographs, the stages of maturation of both girls and boys are shown in what is called the Tanner Atlas. In the atlas, the kids score themselves based on pubic hair, breasts for girls, and genitalia for boys. Question is, are children good at scoring? This is self-scoring. Apparently so. In private settings where they see themselves in the mirror alone, they score themselves quite accurately. They compare their maturation to the standard pictures provided, and in a separate anal analysis, one-on-one -on -one between them and the clinician, both scores are highly correlated. Sure, there are errors. Most of the time, the girls are better at scoring. But for the most part, generally, kids score themselves quite accurately. Even the pattern of errors are predictable. Of the few outliers, who do you think overestimates their maturation? Who, on the other hand, tends to underestimate their maturation? Think about this for the girls when they're assessing their breasts. Uh, what do we know socially the girls tend to do in terms of form? Are the girls the ones that want to uh, blend in? Whereas the boys, what do they do? They want Do they want to stand out? There's the, um, that's why this refers to the term dimorphism. There's two different forms. Finally, the well, gold standard in maturation, however, is x-ray of the bones or bone maturation. Before we get to the bones, let's summarize the maturation events that every parent or clinician should, should, should take note of. In the boys, uh, the timeline of both peak height, uh, height velocity and the tanner scales for pubic hair and genitalia are shown. Now, Another event that is also marked in this graph is spermarchy. This is the boy's ability to generate sperms, and this is a much harder event to track compared to the counterpart menarchy for girls. Nevertheless, what's important is the timing. Okay. Note that this is the peak height velocity. If you look in terms of the timeline, peak height velocity typically precedes the next events, which is the S and then the jump to four, the jump to four, and eventually to five as the child matures. Another thing to note is that boys typically do not have a mid-growth spurt compared to the girls. Obviously, there's nothing to plot for the boys, for the girls, it's going to happen before nine. But recall the metaphor that we use when it comes to growth spurts in boys, because they have this one single mountain to climb where all the energies and growing with high velocity and changing the pubic hair and genitalia occurring in this very short period of time. 
okay think about it the numbers jump from two to three take hmm, roughly a year and a half to jump from two to three whereas the three to four jump happens in a very short window less than a year what do those progression of numbers indicate think about it they are growing so fast and their bodies are changing drastically as well why do you think middle school the middle school years are the most difficult in terms of the children's lives they are dealing with tremendous changes physically and maturationally some kids can gain up to six inches in height in one summer and the bodies are also maturing rapidly in this slide we conduct the same analysis that we did for boys in this time for girls the timeline of female maturation is shown and you've seen this diagram previously so height velocity is a good pictorial means to show the growth spurt in girls now, there is something missing in this, uh, in this graph, however. Take note that the graph, the diagram starts at nine years of age. What do we know is happening prior to that? Right about here, between six and a half to eight and a half years old. This is what we know as the mid-growth spurt, which is not common in boys typically seen in girls so in essence girls have a two wave or two tier growth pattern they have this mid growth spurt here and then the main growth spurt occurring um, in this case the base of the mountain begins just before 11 years old peak height velocity happens here and like the boys it peak height velocity precedes menarche so and then it will peak and then goes down in here so now let's turn our attention to those numbers here two three four and five is it possible that because the girls have a two wave pattern of growth this is not as turbulent as the boys note that it's pretty even two to three three to four in the breast development not as you know big leaps of growth compared to the boys at this period so that I guess that's an advantage if you can call it that but if you look at this graph the girls pretty much have less drama physically now here I'm going back to diagramming this peak height velocity comes first before menarche but rarely do you measure peak height velocity no normal person will just do measure peak height velocity what normal moms put on their kitchen doors or bathroom doors is the uh, the raw data height but as i said menarche is a very well tracked event when menarche happens every girl knows it thus you know in terms of looking at that those events you will hear me say menarche is the beginning of the end well menarche is the only one that girls are painfully <laughs> or at least the parents are very very aware of as an event nobody tracks phv in the casual normal way not unless you're a scientist but this is where this is very important once menarche happens pretty much you know that the girl is already on a downhill slope as far as her growth pattern is concerned she's not shrinking but she's well on her way to almost the end of her growth spurt so what what is the controversy well um, there's several apps so many layers to this when you're at the beginning of your end which menarche indicates chances are you're not going to grow another six inches for a lot of moms who are not aware of this for them to have this pipe dream that oh their daughter has already had menarche she's already five six she entertains the thought of going to the WNBA that's not going to happen menarche signals the beginning of the end it means you have peaked already peak is over menarche is downhill another way of looking at this is when you think of certain sports where they say it stunts your growth gymnastics has been routinely accused of this that gymnastics causes girls to stunt in their growth 
Yet by general accounts, gymnasts are not gymnasts. They follow the same pattern. Two to three, three to four in pubic hair, two to three, three to four spread out in this very short period of time. And early, the girls start at 11, the boys start a little bit later, but the girls pretty much, whether you're a gymnast or not, you follow the same growth pattern. How about this? Is it possible that there's self-selection that's occurring so that it explains that the smaller kids tend to stay in gymnastics because the strength to, to weight ratio works in their favor? Most successful gymnasts these days are five feet or below. Case in point, Simone Biles at 4.8. Before accusing anomaly in certain sport, it is always look good to look at data. We have data to support normal growth and maturation patterns in girls, either in gymnastics or just being an ordinary girl. Finally, there is that saying, show me the kids, show me the mummy. Mothers typically pass on their genes to their daughters. What are the chances that the maturation of the child mirrors that of their mothers? So menarche is the beginning of the end. You've already seen that. And then before you accuse sports of certain, think about this growth patterns that is typical for the girls. Um, instead of worrying about adverse effects of sports uh, on children, the bigger problem probably hovering above the United States right now is obesity. Mind you, sports, youth sports has so many problems. I acknowledge that. But in this case, though, in terms of the health crisis that's facing us, we cannot ignore the obesity question. There's so many issues to be unpacked in this picture. Remember I showed you, told you, show me the kids, show me the mother. Beyond just sport and maturation, this is not just genetics. Is there something going on in the dynamics of the household? That kid didn't just become fat or obese in, in one week. There is a pattern here. Somebody had to do the, the groceries, as I would always say. Now, for our concern in this course, how does obesity affect maturation? How does obesity affect menarche? Does obesity push maturation or menarche earlier or later? You've seen this graph before. Now think in terms of what obesity does to that graph. Does it push menarche to an earlier event? Is this whole graph shifted to the left early? Think about it for the minute. And I'll give you an, an anecdote that's not so funny at all. There is a child that gave birth at nine and a half years old. She gave birth via cesarean section. But how old do you think she was when she had her menarche? Do you think she's obese? Make an educated guess. Do you think, well, I mean, think if you are giving birth at nine and a half years old, work your way back. 38 weeks behind, before, that's when she had her menarche, which is about eight and a half, somewhere around eight years old. Is that too early for menarche? Is this genetic or is this environment or is it both? What do those mean? America, we have a big problem. That's what it means. The signs of bone. Bone is one of the best measures of maturation. You are expected at this point to already know um, how bone works. I will not reprise the discussion on osteoblasts and osteoclasts and what the growth plates fusing mean. But in terms of maturation, this is where we're going to discuss differences between boys and girls. We we'll go back to that same term called dimorphism. Okay. The neat thing about bone, that we have a um, quite sophisticated tool, the x-ray, that helps identify both the chronological age and the biological age, at least very good estimates. Are some children ahead of their time? Are some delayed? And is there advantage to being early or late? Well, in terms of dimorphism, we do know that the girls are ahead. So when we think of this picture, 
Um, who is more mature? Here are the corresponding uh, ages for this profile. At 48 months for boys, this is the picture, and that has been achieved already by the girls a year before. If you look at the next one, for the same profile, and you can see here with a lot, a lot more uh, carpal um, uh, wrist bones. Uh, your your phalanges are all in here, but the wrist bones are pretty clear indicators of a lot more maturation. This one is achieved by girls at around 10 and a half years old, 126 months, whereas the boys, they don't reach this level of maturation until 13 years old or 156 months. So we can tell by these pictures, and the neat thing about x-rays, they're easy and cheap nowadays. Now, how early is dimorphism evident? If this is the picture for the girls at 36 months, they're already a year ahead. You know, it's not visible to the naked eye, but at two years old, are they already ahead of their two-year-old boy counterpart? So there are really differences for the boys and girls here. Now, to the crux of the matter, why is motor development important for bones? In other words, what do, what do skills have to do with bones? I keep repeating the same thing. If you're good at something, you stick with it. If you're bad, you'll probably give up sooner than later. So if kids have a lot of skill, have a lot of motor development, do they tend to bear more weight on their bones, exercising, running, jumping, hopping, skipping, dancing, whatever it is? What happens if a girl stops exercising? Do they miss the crucial window for bone development? Can they recover from these? Or in cases where the girl is delayed, when bone, when bone growth is not happening, does this mean that girls who are delayed, I mean, there's a question there if there is pathology, are they sick? Or they're just genet genetically blessed to have a longer window of time for which they can grow, as long as they do not, do not stop exercising. Remember, skills, exercise, putting weight, gravity, having a crucial effect on the bones is a long-standing fact. You need gravity for bone to develop. So, knowing that, is it crucial to get girls to weight train healthily, even at a very young age? These are the things that you contemplate when you start looking at maturation based on bone. There are so many layers to the relationship between bone and maturation. However, a phenomenon that could best illustrate this is what's called the female athlete triad. I suspect a lot of females are aware of this, but for the men, who, be, who will become future coaches of female athletes, this is a discussion worth having. How are bones related to the menstrual cycle of girls? How are porous bones related to amenorrhea? I jumped there quite a bit, but when a girl who's already had her menarche suddenly stops having her period, that is what's called secondary amenorrhea. I wanna make a distinction here because there are athletes who are typically late matures, that is called primary amenorrhea. And it, this is not necessarily bad, but secondary amenorrhea is definitely bad. So secondary amenorrhea is related to malnourishment. So when you're malnourished, you're not eating properly, your bones become porous. Think of it, why? The third leg of that female athlete triad is called anorexia and bulimia or malnourishment, okay, here it is where you have low energy, you have disordered eating. Anorexia and bulimia are serious conditions afflicting many athletes. It's quite common in gymnastics, figure skating, ballet, other sports that are high endurance sport. So the body shuts down, it is literally on self-preserved mode. In so doing, it will postpone certain functions that the body can live without. 
And that's the case for the menstrual cycle. It is a telltale sign that the child is unhealthy. Most male coaches are probably unaware of this, that their athlete is already dangerously flirting with disaster. When the body shuts down, the demand for nutrition is the same. In fact, it's, the demand for nutrition is far exceeding the supply of good food. The body begins to eat itself up. It has to get its calcium. Every muscular contraction requires calcium. You know this from your physiology. Okay. Therefore, um, where does the body get all its calcium? Literally, it is going to get from, from the existing bone. The body is essentially eating itself up. Thus, it comes to a point when the bone is already porous. That's why it's called osteoporosis. So it begins with bad nutrition, ends up having men, menstrual disturbance, and, it, and, and now you're compromising your bone. This is the female athlete triad. I'm going to discuss another part that having nothing to do with female athlete triad, but bone and maturation are also um, very intricately tied. Tied. When you have very young, young athletes that are training so very hard at elite levels at very young ages, can their bones also be compromised by overtraining? Think of the kid that we discussed in the other module, the four-year-old training for a marathon. How do they, his ankles, knees, and hip look like? If you're pounding the pavement for an extended period of time when you're only four years old. So you can see there's a very complex relationship between bone and maturation. How will the maturation of these young athletes proceed when we are compromising the very health of the individual? So, the reason this is an application um, video, because we literally want to know um, the dangers that people expose themselves to. Who will break their bone? Males or females? Given all that you know right now because of the pattern of behavior, who quit sport early? Who is the one that, who have tendencies for body image issues? Not eating properly, starving themselves. Uh, there are men who do this too, but uh, by and large, if you look at the data, who tends to break her hip? Grandpa or grandma? Why should women weight train even as a very young, at a very young age? M women are not aware of how important, how crucial that growth spurt is, that window of time where they're supposed to be training and interacting with gravity. Why are girls starting from 12 years old vulnerable to or likely to lose VO2 max strength and bone. Who will break their bones? Who will extend that time period now, given that this is a lifespan motor development course, who will more likely break their hip at 70 years old? Males or females? You know the answer to this right now. I'm driving home the point. The sedentary versus the active. You know, for the women who lose out on that window of time at 12 and during those years you cannot that ship has sailed that window is closed but it, it's never too late to start being active um, active is still better than sedentary at any age but you just wish that everybody took advantage of that window of time before now what about overtraining and moderate training uh, we know this phenomenon of being overtrained um, some athletes are you know you have to put it in their head to rest. It's amazing that something as true as this um, is not emphasized more. Now, here's the last contrast. Swimmer or basketball player, assume everything else is equal. They're both active, they just happen to play very different sport and it's very pure. All the swimmer did is swim, all the basketball player did is play basketball. Who is interacting more with gravity? I'm not gonna give you the answers, but you can tell that there, these are principles that you ought to be able to draw upon. We have come to the third area, the third sub area of unit number three that will be covered in exam number three. So 
please pay attention. We are going to talk about the physical, physiological considerations when training children, especially for cardiovascular endurance and strength. Um, you are responsible for knowing what those tests are, um, heart rate, stroke volume, VO2 max. Um, since I know that you are more information tends to be absorbed when you look at specific cases. That's what we're going to do for the next set of discussions. Like I said, um, your stories are actually reinforcing what you know scientifically. Endurance matters, VO2 max matters. We are talking about the case of Lance Armstrong, but before we can do that, you have to have a basic knowledge of what the max and the VO2 max stands for. Why did Lance Armstrong's VO2 max indicate cheating? Uh, in this diagram, you have the range of norms for men when it comes to VO2 max. Lance Armstrong's VO2 max looks good relative to this table. And here are his numbers. It's 84. Here, the excellent numbers are anything above 60. So what gives? Why are we discussing him? Well... This becomes relevant when, when you think of the data that's abundant there in the internet. It's available. Compared to other elite athletes, how does Lance Armstrong stack up? So before you is a table of the top five VO2 max ever recorded. At least I think this is still up to about 2014. Now, um, the only American in the list is a guy named uh, Greg LeMond. Here is his number, he's fifth. What's his story? A lot of questions in here. I know it's a table, it's hard to read, but think in terms of the sports that dominate, you know, this endurance, this work capacity gold standard. You have two cross country skiers and three cyclists. How does Lance Armstrong compare? Remember I told you his VO2 max, I'll put it up again in here. He ranks number 22 out of the top 30. His VO2 max is 84, nowhere near the elite levels uh, of the top five. And the last American to do it was Greg LeMond, and he won the Tour de France three times. How many times did Lance Armstrong win the Tour de France? By the way, this data was recorded when he was doping, okay? Let's establish some facts. Tour de France is the most grueling bike race by all measures. How did Lance Armstrong win seven Tour de France's with a mediocre level of VO2 max? Something to think about. Greg LeMond uh, at that time, early 2000s, was beginning to cast doubt on this and he questioned this because he knew the numbers. He had been tested over and over again. Having, no, having this numbers in public, uh, I think Lance Armstrong was tested at the UT Austin. Greg came out and said, look, something is iffy here, but uh, good old Americans that we are, we didn't want to rock the boat because Armstrong, the good old team USA, was winning seven Tour de France's. He was vilified for sowing doubt on this uh, on, on Armstrong's results, but science vindicates Le Monde. The Tour de France uh, eventually stripped Armstrong of all his titles because it, it, and it came from his mouth. I mean, he literally copped to it that he was uh, cheating. So next, having established endurance is a good thing to earn for fitness, we now turn to strength. You already have seen the slide before. I just wanted to confirm to you that strength follows very clear physical laws uh, dictated by Newton's second law of motion. Force is the ability, it is the product of mass times acceleration. In other words, size matters, but speed matters also, okay? To maximize strength, and here's where I'll make my case, it requires for, uh, from a child's perspective, you grow, you become stronger as you grow, you become stronger as you mature. Those are two associated words. Mass is associated with growth. 
function or acceleration is associated with maturation. The story is in the data that has to deal with the boys and girls. Um, I'm not going to repeat everything that was shown to you in module 9b, but please make sure to rehash these things. Where do the boys earn their increase in strength largely? Well, they're both growing and maturing, but the boys never stop playing sport. What happened to girls? We were, we were growing too. But there was very little acceleration or maturation because a lot of girls have stopped playing sport. We will try to finish up on more issues regarding training children. Unfortunately, one of the best ways to do this is to tackle controversies. Number one, um, are strength and endurance training maximized in prepubertal children? Another way of stating this is, do you get more bang for your buck if you train very early on? I guess we're so concerned that we, are, we want the youngest. We're number one, the youngest number one. Um, these are kids before their growth spurt. Is it worth it? When you're training very young athletes, what do you emphasize first? Skills, endurance, or strength? You know that this is a motor development class. You know the approach of this um, emphasis on skills. The idea that skills will actually bring more bang for their buck because the kids will stick it out. And the idea of solving our obesity problem is to give kids the tools so that they can participate more. Why do girls drop off of exercise by the time they get to 12 years old? This is the crucial window of time where bone layering is rich, and yet it's at precisely when they stop playing sport. Is this something genetic? Is there something in the environment that we can uh, point to? Is there something, more importantly, is there something that we can do? The other end of the spectrum is, are there risks involved in overtraining children? Okay, we talked already about the four-year-old marathoner. Finally, um, I'm going to show you, I'm going to append a video link here, but um, most of you have heard of it. If you have not, please study, please do a dive uh, on YouTube on why gymnastics is particularly controversial. So watch the video on your own at your leisure. It can, if you have Netflix, go to it. But... Um, these are something to think about and we'll be covering for unit number three exam. As we continue our discussion on training, um, it can't be helped that we have to deal with the overwhelming problem of obesity in this country. Here are several weight loss program controversies that you, uh, we ought to at least have a cursory discussion. No pain, no gain. You've heard this before. Is this correct? Is this what you're going to tell your kids? Should we use, we use weight loss programs for adults that seem to might be effective, but are they appropriate to use in children? Example, look, how many of you adults can, can you know, keep at it, uh, doing extended runs on a tra tra treadmill? Because you're an adult. Is it fair to expect this for children? What happens if you're pounding the pavement on the heavy, remember these are obese kids already, pounding on their knees and their ankles. Is there a better way to approach this? Okay. How does motor development offer a better, better long-term approach in solving the obesity problems in children? You've heard me preach this before. I don't need to be up on my soapbox again, but skill, 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 skill. As you look at this semester, we are literally reaching a crescendo. We've started from the very beginning with the origins of, of movement, but as we you know, approach the, the middle and the end of the semester, the whole idea is to concentrate on skill. You know how that works with gravity. So the message of this course is to keep on keeping on for the kids. This is the last slide of this video. And um, rather than uh, give you more, you have had enough information. As, as I said, this is the most packed section of the semester. But 
keep in mind that we are approaching this semester with a firm belief system that will guide you in understanding why things are so. So as you watch this video, keep in mind the dynamical systems theory, the Newell's triangle that we were talking about earlier in the semester. How do environment, individual, and task shape athletes? Okay, these are as you listen to this uh, TED talk by uh, David Epstein, I think, um, are athletes really getting faster, better, or stronger? Think about how the environment shaped it, the times. Think about individuals with very different configurations. We talked about this in growth. Think about very specific task um, conditions or contexts under which our athletes train. These are all shaping their behavior and shaping, um, and many of them shaping their careers. So it's a good way to end this video. Watch at your own leisure, but um, take notes and see how it integrates what we've been saying all along as far as this course is being driven by our belief system.